I would love to welcome everyone to Book Passage this evening. We are so lucky to have Tom Killian with us this evening. And thank you all for coming out to support your independent bookstore and also one of our favorite artists here at Book Passage. Tom's absolutely stunning new book, California's Wild Edge, The Coast in Prints, Poetry and History. And this gorgeous book is really an exploration of the beauty and grandeur of the coast that we have the privilege of living so close to. Alongside Tom's evocative woodcut images, we discover the poetry and prose of Pulitzer Prize winning poet Gary Snyder, as well as work by Robinson Jeffers, Robert Haas, and Jamie D. Angelo. This book is actually Tom and Gary's third collaboration together. They also created the books The High Sierra of California and Tamil Pious Walking. And we do have both of those books this evening, if anyone missed those. And this kind of symbiotic relationship between artist and poet makes this a, a perfect book for anyone who really loves and appreciates California. So I think it's only appropriate that uh, we all give Tom Killian a wild welcome to Book Passage. <laughs> Thank you, Book Passage, which has uh, supported me and had my art on the walls now for you quite a few. Microphone, Tom. Uh, <laughs> my mother is here. She forgot her hearing aid. So you'll excuse me if we turn the volume up just a little bit. <laughs> so uh, it's it's really uh, a great pleasure to be here able to finally talk about this book I've been working on for five years <laughs> and and we had a, a nice celebration for the book out in Point Reyes it was also a fundraiser for the um, heyday books that, that uh, actually published the book they're a nonprofit and they raised about twenty thousand uh, dollars so you guys are not um, contributing forty dollars a piece by being here but you don't get to hear uh, Gary Snyder read his poetry, or Jane Hirschfield, or Jerry Martin, who I doubt any of you know very well, but he's a, another great poet that was there. He's from Humboldt. And this book is filled with poetry. Much of it is from people that um, are relatively unknown, even to people that know something about California poetry. And I've realized over the course of doing this book how little anybody knows about California poetry. People know who Gary Snyder is because he was seen as one of the beats and, and kind of a, uh, in a way, a philosopher of the counterculture. Uh, so, so he goes sort of beyond poetry, but Robinson Jeffers, the, probably the greatest poet of the California coast, who in the 1920s and uh, early 30s was really a a household name uh, in anybody that read literature in California, actually throughout the United States probably. He had his picture on the front of Time magazine when that actually meant something in the, like 1928 or something. And, um, and today, uh, I'm always so surprised when I say, well, Robinson Jeffers is the, the most important figure in this book besides Gary Snyder. Um, they say, who's that? <laughs> And, and I'm sure that some of you probably haven't heard much about him. So this book is, a, is sort of a combination of two of my favorite artistic mediums. Uh, I, I'm, of course, uh, mostly involved in a visual language. I mean, I have to use that silly word language where it doesn't belong because Visual art is just a form of communication all its own, and uh, it, it speaks to people in a way that has nothing to do with words. So the book is filled with my art, and you can just look at that uh, without having to read anything in there and get a lot of what I want to express about the coast of California. Uh, it's uh, 
something that's better done through art. But there's a whole other side of the coast that is the human side of the coast and all the stories of people and the past and cultural uh, ideas that people have been involved in. And that is expressed very well in the poetry of the coast. The beauty of poetry is, is that it really gets to the point, uh, is worked very carefully by the poets so that each word uh, strikes a particular note. Uh, it's, it's, it's a much more exacting art form than regular prose writing. And there was a time in the not too distant past when poetry was really quite popular, very well appreciated. Uh, people uh, learned poems by heart, recited them in uh, school, and would, would recite poetry to each other to entertain each other. There was no radio or TV or internet or anything else. So uh, it was really um, quite popular in the 19th century, all throughout the uh, European and English-speaking world. Uh, there were great poets that everybody knew and could recite their poems. Uh, in California, which was really a rough frontier in those days, there were uh, two or three people that aspired to uh, sort of reach the standards of the great English romantic <coughs> poets. Uh, and the early ones, we've forgotten most of their names. Uh, some of them had something to say about the coast. One who I particularly liked was uh, Ina Colbreth who has such an interesting story. Uh, the first poet laureate of uh, California, she got her crown of laurel in 1915, 100 years ago at the uh, Panama Pacific Exposition over there on the marina, um, where they filled in the wetlands to build this amazing city of lights uh, that's having its centennial this year. Um, and Ina Colbreth wrote some very lovely poems about the coast. You can find one of them in here, written way back in the 1880s. Uh, and quite a few other uh, older poems are in here, but most of the poetry in here is from the 20th century. And, and the real touchstones of the book are the poetry of Robinson Jeffers, who settled down in Carmel around 1915 and built a stone tower. And as one of... Uh, the people that writes about poetry said he uh, lived the life of a high romantic poet. He really tried to be what a poet was supposed to be in the 19th century in sort of English British culture, uh, living out on the edge of a wild and rocky coast um, in a stone tower, keeping to himself. He and his wife, and, and his wife had the same kind of romantic ideas. Uh, uh, about how to live their life, and they they really lived it, you know, in in the way that the, they imagined the Scottish bards were supposed to live. Uh, it, it was it was pretty it was pretty amazing what they did. Um, few other people could kind of live up to that ideal, and nobody wrote as much about the coast as Robinson Jeffries did. Some of his poetry is really hard to take these days. It, even at the time, I think it was a little uh, overwrought, especially the long poems with lots of murders and incest and all the rest. Uh, and they were kind of long stories, you know, set in free verse. But he wrote some amazing short poems uh, that really touch uh, the soul of the California coast. And there's a few in here, and there's quite a bit of uh, poetic conversation about Robinson Jeffers in this book, because he uh, he's somebody that every poet of the California coast has read. And doing this book, I discovered that every single one of them wrote a poem about him, whether they were well-known poets or, uh, or lesser poets or just amateur poets. Everybody's read so written something about Robinson Jeffers. And so I have a, an interesting poetic conversation between Gary Snyder Robert Haas, who of course has been Poet Laureate of the United States several times, and grew up here in San Rafael, and uh, um, Cheslav Milos, 
who was the Nobel uh, Prize winner in poetry, and uh, Polish by birth, of course, and settled over in uh, Berkeley, lived more of his adult life in Berkeley than, than anywhere else in the world. And uh, he and Robert Haas uh, worked together on quite a few things. Uh, Robert Haas translated some of his poetry. And uh, Milos really didn't understand Jeffers and didn't like him much. <laughs> and uh, Haas, at first, um, uh, was, I'm sure, influenced by Milos and uh, somebody at, at Stanford named Eva Winters, uh, not to like Jeffers too much. But he, he studied him more, and he got to like him, and wrote a, a very interesting introduction to uh, the best modern book of Jeffers' poetry, uh, which is called Rock and Hawk. And it's a great introduction. If any of you want to get to know Jeffers, that's the thing to read. Um, and then Gary Snyder wrote his own sort of repost to their poems, which were pretty uh, strongly worded uh, in a way that wasn't really in Robinson Jeffers' favor. <laughs> so I've got this three-way poetry conversation with you know little additions to it going on in the book in one place. And then, I, of course, my favorite poet on the coast of California, who's still alive, and I've had the great pleasure of doing three books with, uh, is Gary Snyder. And he actually got to know the coast right here in Marin County when he was uh, studying uh, Chinese at UC Berkeley in the early 50s. He drove over uh, on, in his 1937 Packard uh, to um, Richmond and put it on the Santa Fe car ferry. There wasn't any bridge yet. And landed on Point San Quentin and drove out uh, Sir Francis Drake Boulevard all the way to Point Reyes several times, taking big groups of friends with him. And they'd like to go out to a place uh, up at the northern end of the Point Reyes Peninsula near where Pierce Ranch is and, and camp on the beach sometimes for a week at a time. It was before there was a national seashore. This is in the 1950s. And he wrote a lot of poetry about that place. And, and one of his poems uh, is uh, printed here on a broadside, and I have a few of them here that you can buy, that um, has a print of mine, a Point Reyes reproduced on it, and letterpress printed, um, and it's called Point Reyes. So since Gary isn't here, I'll take the liberty to read you one poem out of the book that's a Marin County poem. Sandpipers at the margin, in the moon, Bright fan of the flat creek on dark sea sand. Rock boom beyond. The work of centuries and wars. A car is parked a mile above where the dirt road ends. In naked, gritty sand, eye-stinging, salty driftwood campfire smoke. Out far, it all begins again. Sandpipers chasing the shiny surf in the moonlight by a fire at the beach. Gary wrote that in the 1950s. Uh, he wrote a few really nice poems about Point Reyes. Later on, he wrote a very interesting one um, when he went over with his uh, wife, who passed away a few years ago, Carol Coda. They were on a date, and they were out on the coast, and they went to Johnson's Oyster farm on Drake's Estero. This must have been back in the 1980s. And uh, he wrote a poem to Sir Francis Drake. They, I think they had hiked out along the beach uh, and seen that plaque that was put up where um, a lot of historians think Sir Francis Drake landed way back in 1579. And uh, he quotes that at the beginning of the poem. And he has a really nice poem to, uh, to Sir Francis Drake. And, and the fog that obscured the land of California that he never saw. And then at the end, they have a, a cup of Gallo wine, and, uh, <laughs> but he calls it sack, which is what Sir Francis Drake would have called it. And, uh, and, an, and an oyster, a raw oyster, out of, out of the jar. And that's what Johnson's did, you know. This was before oysters on the half shell. It was canned oysters in jars. Uh, to Sir Francis Drake, and he drinks the, the, the sack out of a Sierra Club cup. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good poem, and that's in here too. 
So th this book is really a, a journey through all the literary history of the coast of California. I call it a poetic history. And it hits on a lot of uh, high points that other people haven't really paid any attention to. Like the uh, first trip up the coast uh, overland by anybody who, uh, who wrote anything down, the, the first Spanish expedition up the coast which gives you incredible glimpses into Native American culture before it had, you know, succumbed to its contact with the European uh, culture. And, and it also um, is sort of a wild goose chase looking for a harbor at Monterey that, that had been described 150 years before, and they were still searching for it. And it didn't quite fit the description, and they went right past it, even though they camped there for a week. <laughs> and, and because they went past it, they found San Francisco Bay, which had never been discovered after 200 years of Spanish seafarers passing along the coast. Had never been discovered uh, from the sea, but it was discovered from the land. And, and, and then there's stories from uh, people that rode their horses up the coast in the early 20th century. Because I'm looking for people that really experience the pl place uh, at a foot pace or sailing on ships before uh, steamships could go against the wind and the currents when it took year it would take uh, months and months and months to sail from Mexico up to California and just a few weeks to sail back down because all the currents and the winds are against you when you're trying to sail north um, and the people that rode their horses along the coast even in the 20th century they really got to see the coast in a different way, especially some of the wilder parts of the coast, like Big Sur, which only had trails in it <coughs> right up until they built the coast road in the 1920s. One of these people that um, rode his horse along the Big Sur coast was Jaime de Angelo, who was a, uh, a Spanish sort of uh, pseudo-noble uh, raised in Paris, went to a Jesuit school in Paris, spoke French and Spanish, and ran away uh, from Europe to uh, the Western United States to be a sheep herder of all things when he was 17, uh, but ended up being a buckaroo and, and uh, working on a horse ranch uh, up in nor far northern California, got interested in uh, the languages of uh, native people like the Modoc, and went on after getting a medical degree to study linguistics with uh, Kroeber at UC Berkeley, Kroeber of Ishi fame. And, uh, and, and then, uh, along with several different wives, gathered, um, collected many different native languages, including he worked a lot on Miwok, and uh, left a big body of, of work to, to us today that allows people <coughs> to redevelop um, native California languages after they, they had almost disappeared. Um, but, but one thing he did that was very interesting is in 1915, he homesteaded a ranch about 25 miles beyond the end of the wagon road down in Big Sur. And, and he could only get there by horseback. And he, was, he had become quite an experienced horseman. And, and so he uh, had a little herd of horses that he had driven all the way from Modoc County in, in 1915, down to Big Sur, and he had them up on in his ranch there. And over many years, he lived on that ranch. And I was able to find his uh, his uh, log books that he had started in, in 1915 when he when he first built a little cabin on the on the ranch uh, so that he could homestead it. You have to improve it uh, to get a homestead title. Um, and, and then he uh, kept that logbook all the way until he died in 1948. And it's full of uh, very interesting descriptions of uh, Big Sur life and, and a lot of poetry. He was a bit of a poet, and I've included some poems in the book. So, so the life of Jaime de Angelo, especially his Big Sur part of his life, um, is, is another really interesting story that a lot of people don't know. That, um, that is told in some detail in this book. And then I've got um, a lot of passages out of Gary Snyder's uh, uh, own journals. He, kept, he has kept very good journals uh, throughout his life. And uh, they're all in an archive that I had access to. And 
I, I found a lot of interesting details about, uh, about his social life on the uh, wild coast of West Marin. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he allowed me to publish some of them. <laughs> and, along with some of his poems. And then the most interesting part of the whole project for me, uh, besides doing some new woodcut prints for, for the book, um, because many of the prints in here, you know, they go back 40 years. Some of them I did when I was a teenager here in Marin County. Um, the most interesting part of the, the project for me was working with Gary Snyder. In fact, one of the main reasons I did the book was an excuse to get to work with Gary on another project. <laughs> and and uh, it, was, it was really so interesting to go up to his place in Nevada City, up on the ridge above Nevada City, and spend uh, two or three days, two consecutive summers, where we just sat out at a table um, and talked all day long about the poetry of the California coast. I brought him a whole bunch of poems and poets and wanted to know what he thought of it, and that got him going off on all these different tangents. And uh, some of that uh, is in the book also, as part of the text. And I, I was really surprised to find that that Gary really did like Robinson Jeffers, <laughs> unlike other poets, as I mentioned. Uh, and, and he felt that because Jeffers was able to describe the natural setting of the California coast so well, and had spent so much time out walking the coast, uh, that, that it was worth reading Jeffers. Even when, when Gary was young, he enjoyed reading Jeffers, because at least he was there, and he really experienced it, the outdoors and wrote about it, and very few people were doing that in those days. Um, Gary sort of invented a new form of poetry almost, this, this poetry of the West Coast outdoors in the mountains and along the coast. Um, and now it's quite popular, but you don't see much of it. And I had to work hard to find a lot of uh, the kind of poetry I was interested in for this book. But I did find several other people that uh, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy reading their poems, I'm sure, uh, that nobody ever you know, talks about. I mean, relatively unknown poets. So it was a great project for me. And I, I'm so happy that it all came together. And Heyday was very supportive. And Malcolm Margolin managed to work me through some thorny issues with some of the descendants of some of the people whose journals I was working with. Uh, so Malcolm is uh, really a big part of this book. Uh, and, and some of his stories are in there, too, because he's a great storyteller. Uh, and, and Gary is, of course, the, the inspiration for a lot of the book. And I've got to say that Gary also inspired me to, um, to do my art in a certain way, uh, because I read his poems when I was a teenager in my early 20s, and I was sort of conceiving where I wanted to go with, um, with in, in the terms of art and, and making books of art and poetry. Uh, so that was an inspiration for me. And finally, I want to mention that um, I also had a, uh, a very inspiring um, poet printer as a teacher down at UC Santa Cruz, William Everson. And Everson, uh, who was also known as Brother Antoninus when, when he was uh, a uh, brother in the Dominican order over in a workers, Dominican workers' house in Berkeley, in the 19, late 40s and 50s, um, and right up into the 60s. And, and as, as a brother Antoninus, he was part of the, the beat poetry scene that Gary was part of in San Francisco. So, so he came down to Santa Cruz in the um, early 1970s, and he, he um, set up a, a hand press and taught fine printing, as well as a book called Birth of a, uh, uh, a class called Birth of a Poet uh, at UC Santa Cruz. And, when I first met him, he and a group of students were producing this incredible big folio book of uh, Robinson Jeffers' poems about Point Lobos called Granite and Cypress. And it, it had as a, as a slipcase a incredibly beautiful crafted um, wooden box that was made out of uh, some... Uh, 
Cyprus from Point Lobos uh, that had big cracks in it and you know sort of open places where you could see the the uh, cover of the book inside and then into those cracks the uh, person that made it had inserted these little slips of uh, polished granite what, it, and, and the book itself was extraordinary it, um, Everson knew that Jeffries had intended his, he has very long lines in his poetry, so most books you read because of their form, the lines are turned, and, and they're often turned not necessarily where Jeffries wanted, just where the typesetter decided they should be turned, but as you read, you think of that turn as, as a new line, sort of, which isn't you know, really what it's meant to be. So he wanted to run the lines all the way out, so the book is like this long, <laughs> and it's this huge thing. Uh, and, and getting to know Jeffers uh, through that book really um, inspired me uh, in, in my love of Jeffers' poetry, also in wanting to do a book of my own about, about the coast. And a, and a few years later, I did create this big hand-printed book called The Coast of California. Uh, the big mistake I made was I used my own poetry, <laughs> and, and then I had to I had to live with with that poetry slightly modified over about thirty years because it it was continued to be the text of this sort of growing book that turned into a trade edition book called The Coast of California in 1988, and then got republished uh, in another a, a paperback edition with new prints, but still the same poetry. So. Uh, finally, I've had the uh, wonderful uh, good fortune that Heyday Books and Malcolm Margolin allowed me to write a new text, uh, and, and they said it had to be really long because they had so many prints, and the prints had to uh, have um, space to breathe. So uh, I hope you read the text. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't talk it down. But as an artist, I sometimes think of the text as really uh, the filler in between the, the images. <laughs> but I had a lot of fun writing it. And, and I think because of all the wonderful poetry by other people about the coast that's in it, it um, it's, uh, it's a lot better than the old book. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm here to talk. Oh, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, grab a couple of uh, uh, props. <laughs> I only need one of those. So this is... This is the this is the uh, one coastal print that didn't make it into the book. I just finished it uh, last month, and it's uh, at the far southern end of Limiter Beach, where there's a uh, a walking campground called Coast Camp. So the name of the print is Coast Camp, and here's how I did it. I went out to the bluffs one day. I was out there with my sketchbook and. I looked down the beach and I drew this picture. So, so this is the sketch, and all my prints start from sketches. And then I put tracing paper over this sketch, and with a soft pencil I traced all the lines, and I turned that tracing paper over on my first uncut block. So just a, an empty piece of wood, and I taped it down, and I went over the back of all the lines with a ballpoint pen, and I got the, the pencil sketch all transferred uh, in reverse because you have to carve your blocks in reverse. And then I got my Japanese carving tools and I carved what became the key block for the print. So that's the, the black one. Uh, and then I, before I started making the print, I had to get blocks to do the different colors. So I decided I was going to use three different colors on the, the print. Um, and I needed three blocks. So to, to get the image transferred in reverse onto the other blocks so that I could get everything to line up when I went to print it, I printed the key block, the black one, onto um, acetate. And while the ink was <coughs> still wet, I turned it over and I rubbed it and I got the image transferred onto each of those blocks. And then I made one for 
the sky and the sea, and one for the beach, and one for kind of the yellow behind the hills and the beach and the moon. So here's the yellow block, so you get a sense of it. And, and then there was three other ones. Um, and then there was the key block. And I just brought a couple of them because I, I still am not quite finished with the last part of the edition, and I, I don't want to wreck the other ones. But these ones I'm definitely done with, so you're welcome to look at them. <laughs> and, and then I start by printing the lightest color, which would have been this yellow color. So, so I, I first printed this, and all you would see would be the, the yellow on the white paper. And I had to get everything registered. I had registration <laughs> proofs from the key block to, to get things registered. And then I do like 175, so that's a stack of 175 pieces of paper. So each day of printing takes a few hours to get things registered and get the color set up, and then several hours of printing. And so it's a whole day. So uh, 175 is certainly the most I can do. People always ask me, why, you know, why do you do certain numbers in your edition? And, and then. And then I have to do the whole thing again the next day on the next color, you know, and part of it is cleaning the press and everything. No, I don't go get it. No, here you go. I had it waiting right here. <laughs> so so that's how that's how I do it. And then the key block, which you which is sort of the template and the thing you start with, is the last thing you print. It goes over everything else and that's the, the black. And, and this is the way I do it. And it's not the way, you know, it, it's just my way of doing it. There's, there's different ways to do things, and this is one way. <laughs> How do you test the register to uh, see the overlap is accurate? Yeah, well, you know, question. yeah, it's kind of complicated to just stand and explain. <laughs> You'd have to get involved in, in, uh, in printing to, to see. It's like a subscreen. Yeah, well, no, it's, you know, sure, you have to, all printmaking, you have to register things, but the way you register etchings and lithos and silk screens is different than the way you register woodcuts, but, and there's different ways to register things. The Japanese uh, carve the blocks so they have the registration marks right in it because they print by hand, but I use a printing press, so I put the block in the bed of the press, and I, I lock it in and then I can adjust where it is in relation to the paper several different ways. There's guides uh, on the feed table that you can adjust and there's, uh, you know, you can adjust where the block sits in the bed of the press and if you get confused and you move it first with the, the feed table guides and then you go to move it in the bed of the press, you forget that you got to move it the opposite direction and, and you get everything wrong at first. And, you know, so it's like double reverse. And Anyway, you, you, can, you can really challenge yourself with it. <laughs> so I never get tired of it. It's always interesting. Yeah. What, what got you uh, interested in wood block in particular? And when did you start putting the block? Well, I, I'm sure that, that I first got interested in it because uh, someone who's sitting right down here in the front row um, took me to some ex exhibits probably. I, I know that my mother took me to the De Young Museum when I was a kid and I, I saw Japanese woodcut prints and I, I know that I saw um, other, you know, print mediums and, uh, and I also I remember particularly seeing a wonderful exhibition of Chinese landscape scroll paintings that I really liked, you know. But, but then I, um, yeah, I, I learned that, um, you know, I, I learned how to cut linoleum blocks when I was a little kid, because they used to teach that in school. Um, they weren't as worried about kids cutting themselves as they are. <laughs> and, and then I thought of, uh, I, I knew that Japanese prints uh, were done on blocks, and um, I'd already fallen in love with Japanese prints and wanted to do pictures of Mount Tamil Pius like Japanese prints. And I was drawing them. So I thought, well, I'll try carving it in a block. And, and then it worked OK, so I did it again. And I got better at it, and I kept doing it. <laughs> so I was a teenager when I got started. Yeah? Where does this passion for the history come in and mix with your artistic touch? Yeah, I think, I, I think 
Yeah, history and poetry and and landscape art, in a way, what ties them all together is an interest in time and thinking about time. I mean, really, time is is one of the one of the deepest human concerns. I mean, you know, people that talk about how humans became humans and mastered the natural world, one of the ways was of all the animals, humans figured out how time works and could project them, the, you know, their ideas of what might happen into the future and back into the past. And so we love messing around with time. And, and you know, the artistic side of messing around is to look at landscapes because the natural world, when you look at it, the big picture, it's kind of change over time that you're seeing there, frozen for a moment, you know. Um, poetry is, is probably the art that, that is most evocative of time. You, there's this sort of wistful quality to the short lines of a poem. I mean, some great Chinese poems from 2,000 years ago, uh, you know, really evoke the passage of time. And of course, European Romantic poetry was all about, you know, remembrance of things past and lost and, you know, all the tragedy of time, you know, and, you know, we all experience it. Uh, and then history is, of course, all about time. <laughs> so I guess that's it, you know, and I, and I grew up with parents that were uh, both history majors in college, you know, and that probably had something to do with it. <laughs> and they, they, and my father liked poetry. He, he always, uh, you know, turn me on to old, you know, classic poems that rhymed, you know, <laughs> that he had to memorize in grammar school. <laughs> yeah. How did you talk more about your affinity with Eastern culture and art and Gary Snyder's affinity with um, Well, I'm totally an amateur at that. Uh, I, my affinity with, with uh, Eastern, East Asian art uh, is, purely because I love it, so I'm an amateur, you know, no, I love it. Um, but, but I don't know anything about it, other than having studied a little bit how Japanese prints are made so that I could figure out my own way of, of doing it that was somewhat similar, um, and having gone to Japan once. But, you know, I spent a long, a lot of years of my life studying African and European history, and you know, working in the archives of the French colonial uh, archives on the Quai d'Orsay and things like that, and you know, living in Africa. So I, yeah, my my professional life that has anything to do with scholarship has nothing to do with East Asia at all. Gary Snyder, on the other hand, is is a uh, a a incredibly well uh, informed and and uh, a great student of. Uh, so many East Asian traditions, especially Buddhism, but also uh, he's very interested in landscape art. Uh, he, he fell in love with these ch Chinese uh, mountains and rivers, landscape scrolls that he saw, uh, particularly um, back in a museum, I think it was in, s not Cincinnati, and um, what's the other? town up on the Cleveland, yes, the Cleveland Art Museum. Sorry, I, I'm so ignorant of my own country. <laughs> I knew it was in Ohio. <laughs> yeah. When he was a grad student back there for just, uh, he was a grad student in the Midwest after he finished Reed College up um, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, he went back for like a year to Indiana, the University of Indiana, to study East Asian literature. And, um, and there was a, an exhibit that was just kind of um, making the rounds, I guess, that he saw. And that set him on his path of what turned into his great opus of poetry, Mountains and Rivers Without End, was, was seeing that fantastic landscape scroll painting uh, when he was young. But, but um, yeah, my, my, my interests, uh, you know, are, are really those of, a, of an amateur, so you, I can't say that. I'm not, I'm not coming from any deep, studious place uh, in, in, my, 
in my faux ukiyo-e. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> part, you know. something you share, obviously, with Snyder. It seems like an appreciation of that. Yeah, we, we do share that, and we realized that. I mean, earlier on, I mean, I, I knew his poetry, of course, long before I knew him. He's 25 old, years older than me. But, but um, I... Uh, I did get that, and then he, he, when he first saw my art, he really liked it, because it, there's just something that I, I don't know why, but I, I found that way of dealing with the landscape visually to be uh, something I aspired to do when I was a little kid, and I've been trying to do it ever since. <laughs> How did you first meet the two of you? Well. I, I saw him read poetry several times, but, but when I actually met him, I went up to visit him uh, up at his place. When he had just built his uh, Japanese-style farmhouse up at Kit Kit Dizzy, his uh, land up uh, on the San Juan Ridge above Nevada City. And he was up there with his, uh, his Japanese wife, Masa, uh, and his two little kids, Kai and Gen. And uh, I through some friends in Mill Valley, because he had lived in Mill Valley for a few years, and he had a lot of friends still around here. Um, the Greenspellers, I, I got to high school with one of their kids. They, they lived up there next to him on another piece of land, and they said, well, come up and visit Gary and, and uh, show him your new book, because I just done my first book, 28 Views in Mount Town Pius, with little haiku poems. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they thought he'd like that, and I brought it up, and I gave him a copy. And in return, I wanted advice on traveling because uh, I wanted to. I was about to set off on like what turned into a, a 14 or 15 month trip all up around Europe and Africa. And and he said, uh, bring plenty of kaopectate. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's always very practical. <laughs> and we've been friends ever since. <laughs> it was good advice, <laughs> especially in Africa. <laughs> When did you both decide to collaborate? Well, actually, um, I asked him if he would uh, let me use one of his poems from Turtle Island, um, Front Lines, um, on a uh, poster with a print of mine that, that I did to benefit um, uh, some land preservation down in Santa Cruz in 1978. Uh, some land called the Poganip, that, and it was successful. I mean, there was a lot of people working on it, and that land became, uh, it's now like a city park um, then then we worked on um, on a couple other projects like that together well I asked him can you give me a poem and, and you know so and, and then he then somebody wanted to do a 60th birthday book about him called dimensions of a life a guy up in Seattle John Halper and and John had asked Gary well what shall I use for illustrations and Gary said well I like this and I like that and oh yeah and there's this guy Tom Killian that does sort of, uh, he does these Japanese style prints that I like. Why don't you ask him? So, <laughs> and I had my couple prints in this book that was all about Gary. So, and then I felt like I could go up there and uh, a few years later I, I went and gave him my book and asked him if um, I should take my with K.O. Peckade. Did you propose to have, for him to be uh, collaborating with you on the High Sierra book? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thanks for the very good questions, Dex. <laughs> I, I went up to Davis and I had a lot of, I had a few prints already done and I laid out the idea and he said, wow, well, sure, uh, I'll have my um, secretary, he had a woman working for him that uh, uh, could read his handwriting, which is very good handwriting. And, and, and I, I got over the course of uh, a year, every few weeks, uh, a few more years of his, of all his journal entries having to do with every trip he ever took or when he worked on the trail crew too, up in the High Sierras. Wow. And just about every year he did that. Even when he lived in Japan, he came back to the U.S. <laughs> three or four different times to be sure to take a big backpack trip in the High Sierra. You know, see, he, and, and I had that same, you know, I've never gone a year that I'm in the United States without going backpacking in the High Sierra. So that was something we really shared. And his journals, he thought I was just going to take a few uh, 
lines out of the journals, I think, uh, and used them sort of like little haiku uh, notes next to my prints, because he remembered that Mount Tam book. But, but I ended up using almost the entire journals. Uh, the, the, the one that's, that's the heyday version that's the same size and everything is this book. They're like a series, by the way, these books. The High Sierra, Walking Tamil Pius, and now this one, they're all my prints and Gary Snyder, and you know, so we've got, we've got the High Sierra covered, we've got the coast covered now, and we have this one little mountain cover too, right here. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, yeah, that project turned into such a great, fun collaboration. Uh, but, you know, I was doing all the editing and everything, and, and it was a great working relationship, and it has been. Gary's been, uh, he's very generous with his stuff, and he doesn't try to control it or restrict it too much, but I understand his sensibility about what he wants to leave out, stuff about uh, personal things, about people that might still be alive or their kids or somebody else might be alive he 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 wants to leave out so now i i i edit it pretty much myself uh, although one thing slipped past us in this book <laughs> i won't tell you which <laughs> you have to read it to find it see if you can find what you think was the, the entry that slipped past <laughs> any other questions <laughs> thank you very much for thank you.